Founded in 1993, SASH works to promote, facilitate, and disseminate research into the rich history and heritage of soccer in the United States. You can find us on the web at ussoccerhistory.org and on social media with our Facebook and Twitter accounts. If you'd like to join the society, visit our website and do so through the Join SASH tab. A few announcements before we start. We're in the midst of another election cycle. Uh, only up-to-date dues-paying members um, can vote and nominate. You should have received an email from the Tellers Committee chaired by Kurt Rausch. Uh, we encourage you to please respond to that email. Uh, so we have several choices for each position. You can self-nominate or nominate others. Just to let folks know, there will be a little bit of a shakeup in, in the hierarchy because after five years as president, I'll be stepping down. So that position will be vacant. So make sure you uh, put a little thought into that and help the society out uh, for new leadership. Since we last met, Ed Farnsworth has revamped the society website and completed the digitization of the Graham Guides. Well done, Ed. Thank you. And then Brian Quarstad has turned all of our SAS sessions into podcasts. So you can find those on the website. Uh, it's just another medium to fulfill our mission. Many thanks to Brian for getting that done. Welcome to the Society for American Soccer History's SAS session with Donald Wine II. His title for today's presentation, American Soccer, is Black American soccer history. A Michigan native, Donald has lived in Washington, D.C. for over 16 years. He's on the national board of the American Outlaws, the largest supporters group for U.S. national teams. You can find him organizing stadium support all around the world. Donald is also the manager of Stars and Stripes FC and has produced podcasts on soccer and college basketball. Our members will likely recognize Donald, like SASH member Marcus Cranston, also known as Eagle Man. They are prominent uh, at U.S. national team matches, whether qualifiers or World Cups or exhibitions. Perhaps we can have Donald return to talk about the history of supporters groups one day. But for today, he's continuing this year's efforts by SASH, which began with Dr. Jermaine Scott's talk last May and that is to better understand the impact and influence of the African-American experience on soccer in the United States. So please help me welcome Donald Wine II. Tom, thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation to join all of you today. It's good to see some uh, familiar names and faces uh, on here today. And for everyone out there who's celebrating, I know last night marked the first day of Hanukkah, so happy Hanukkah to all of you and hope that the next eight days are, are as joyous uh, as they possibly can be with friends and family. And the great thing about this, you know, topic is that it's it's always germane. And and not to borrow a pun from from my friend Jermaine Scott, who did a similar talk earlier this year. But ever since 2018, on my blog Stars and Stripes FC, I've done Black History stories throughout Black History Month, and it started as a personal journey for me to learn about a lot of soccer history, not just in the United States, but around the world. And it's soccer history that really has not been discussed or is, is hard to research. And so my journey was to try and learn something every single day about Black soccer history, not just, again, in America, but around the world. And then at that point, I decided to write it down in the hopes that other people might read it. So this topic or this, this presentation is about some of those stories that I've encountered along the years, uh, some stories that continue to be important today, some that are important to me personally, but I'm really excited to present some of these stories to again say that Black American soccer history is American soccer history. And you have to start, first of all, with the fact that this history is rarely shared or exchanged. And we begin with the pioneers of American soccer. The first two guys, and I know Jermaine, Dr. Scott talked about this in his SASH session uh, a while back, but Oliver and Fred Watson are the two guys, two black guys who first played in a professional soccer league. You have to go all the way back to the 1890s. 
to learn about their history. Now, the thing about Fred was he he was first of all, he was the first one to score in a soccer match. His brother Oliver was the first one to play in a league. But they also had three brothers who did not even care about soccer. And the the thing about these two is that when we think about the first black athletes in particular sports, we know about Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson Day is celebrated every day on April 15th. We know about Willie O'Ree, the first black hockey player. We know about Kenny Washington, the first black NFL player to sign a contract. But very rarely do we hear about the pioneers of American soccer. The, 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 the ones who broke the color barrier, Oliver and Fred Watson, to start, it took a long time to learn about their story and how they came up and became two players on a team that, you know, in, in their old mill in their town. And to progress to now where we see so many people that look like me on the soccer field, it's a testament to the trials and tribulations that Oliver and Fred Watson had when they first got started. And it brings us to some of the other pioneers of U.S. soccer. When we talk about the national team, everyone has seen this photo at some point in their life, Joe Gadgets. What's familiar about this picture is it's about the greatest game, the greatest upset in the history of the FIFA World Cup on the men's side. The U.S. beating England 1-0 in 1950 with Joe Gatchin scoring that goal. Fun fact about this picture, that is not a picture of the goal. As you can see, the ball is on the outside of the net. There is no footage, uh, at least known footage, of the goal that Joe Gatchin scored. But it is a pivotal moment for not just U.S. soccer history, but world soccer history. And the interesting thing about Joe Gatchin's is he wasn't an American citizen when he played in this game because back then all you had to do was declare your intent to be an American citizen, to play for the United States men's national team. He had done so. He had come from Haiti and he and a lot of other players had declared that, yes, I want to be an American citizen. And yes, I want to play for the U S national team, but they never actually did. And so we learn a lot about Joe Gatchins through, through this game. And a lot of people know that name because of this game. But again, while he was from Haiti and he had uh, interest in becoming an American citizen, he actually never did. After this World Cup, he went back to Haiti and was a celebrity hero, he was a sports hero. And of course, his story has a tragic end when uh, Francois Papadoc Duvalier, his family was involved in trying to overthrow him and failed. And his family decided to flee Haiti, but he decided because of his celebrity status, he thought he could stay and be able to kind of, you know, bring the peace uh, in Haiti. Well, that never happened. He was captured and tortured and unfortunately uh, presumed dead because we never saw him once he went to jail in Haiti. So it's a tragic end for one of soccer's main heroes, especially uh, in the black soccer community. But his story led to a lot of people being able to finally break through onto the national team. It did take a long time, though. We have Kim Crabb. Kim Crabb actually never played for an official cap for the U.S. Women's National Team, but she was the first Black woman to be called into a camp. And this was all the way back in 1986. She was followed shortly after by this lady here, Sandy Gordon. She became the first Black woman to have a Women's National Team cap. The two of them played on the team for a few years, but it paved the way for so many others to know that there was a, a way, a pathway to get onto the national team. And when you think about Joe Gatchins, he broke the color barrier for the men's national team. But the first African-American to play in the national team was Eddie Hawkins. Now, when you think about the number of players that have come through just recently, U.S. Soccer released a list of every single men's national team player who has ever stepped foot and played a second for the national team. From one to, I think they're down to like 900. Eddie Hawkins is, again, the first African-American to break through. He broke through in 1984. Now, Joe Gatchins was the 136th U.S. men's national team player to ever play for the program. Eddie Hawkins is number 412. Now, when we talk about Oliver and Fred Watson back in the 1890s, early, early 1900s, to now, it took almost 90 years for an African-American to break through onto the national team. That shows how long that some players are waiting in the wings, maybe or perhaps overlooked. But this also ushered in a new era because after Eddie Hawkins came a couple of guys who then started to show 
that hey, African American players, they got what they got it going on. And those two players are Jimmy Banks and Desmond Armstrong. They both featured on the team during the late 80s. Desmond Armstrong became the first African American to start for the national team in a World Cup. He did so in it's in Italy in 1990. And he also became the first player from America to go to Brazil and play. He ended up playing at Santos, which uh, some of you know is the famous club made famous for Pelé having played there. Pelé's son was the one that picked up Desmond Armstrong at the airport, he told me in an interview. And the fact that that bridge where they were so excited to see a black man come to play for Santos from outside of Brazil is something that really galvanized that country and that particular fan base. Santos, as some of you know, was just relegated for the first time from the Brasileiro just this past week for the first time ever in their history. But Desmond Armstrong is a big part of that history because he opened up doors, not just for Americans to go to Brazil, but back then a lot of Brazilians didn't think that they could go to the United States to play. Sure, Pele played for the Cosmos, but he was one of the only ones that had done so. And that created a pipeline for a lot of Brazilians to start thinking about coming to the United States to play soccer. Now, there's also some players that you know people all have heard of. Eddie Pope. If you haven't heard of Eddie Pope, I, I don't know what to tell you. Eddie Pope is one of the greatest defenders that's ever lived. He's one of my favorite players. Brianna Scurry, arguably next to next to Tim Howard, I consider those two the greatest goalkeepers that America's ever produced. And Brianna Scurry has brought home a World Cup. Eddie Pope, uh, two United or two MLS Cups with DC United, my my home club. But at the same time. Some of these stories aren't necessarily made for you to learn something, but you still do in the process. Eddie Pope is one of the greatest players in my mind that ever lived. And because of him, I was a forward growing up and he was a defender. But somehow Galvin, you know, gravitating towards him, what you learn is that players that look like you can inspire you to do things that you may not think possible. Eddie Pope was one of those things. My cousin played soccer at Duke. She was a goalkeeper. And honestly, some of the moves that she had, one some of the uh, skills that she had, she borrowed from Brianna Scurry. Brianna Scurry was popular at the time. She was still the number one keeper uh, for the U.S. Women's National Team. She had won a World Cup. And because of her, my cousin was able to play for a major university as a goalkeeper. I think that's great. Now, there's a couple of stories that I have done throughout the years that really captivated me. And one of them was, as we move forward, hang on one second. There we go. The 1971 Howard soccer team, Howard University, HBCU. And their story is one of redemption, especially the 1971 team. In 1971, they went to the national championship game against St. Louis University. St. Louis University at the time was one of the most dominant dynasties in the history of college sports. In the 16 years preceding this game, they had won 10 national championships and I believe they had even gotten to the final an additional three times. Basically unstoppable for the better part of a decade and a half. Howard University stopped them. At the Orange Bowl in Miami, they won the national championship, becoming the first HBCU to win a college national championship. This was one of those things that just a few years prior, you would remember in, in basketball, we had Texas Western beating Kentucky to win the 1966 uh, men's basketball national championship. And here we have Howard come through years later and win, becoming the first uh, HBCU to do so. But it was it was very short-lived because in 1972, that title was stripped from them. The NCAA basically said there's no way that they could have won legally. And so they declared that half their team, which had come from uh, different parts of the Caribbean and Africa, they declared them academically ineligible and thus stripped Howard wrongly of their title and then banned them from the postseason for an additional year. So most people would think that's the end of the story and that Howard was a very short lived national champion. Meanwhile, St. Louis university continued their dominance while Howard was on the sidelines. But in 1974, Howard came back. They went undefeated. They outscored their opponents 63 to six throughout the entire year. They went to the national championship at Bush Stadium in St. Louis to play St. Louis University. And you know what? They beat him again. 
1974, Howard wins a national championship, completing the redemption to to right the wrong that was unjustly taken from them in 1971. So 1971 and 1974, Howard wins a national championship, and they again become the first HBCU to win a national championship for the second time. And it's one of those greatest, it's one of the greatest triumphs in the history of soccer in this country. Howard coming back from all of that, being stripped of their title, having a lot of their players declared ineligible or otherwise not able to play and coming back to win the national championship against one of the dynasties. And by the way, they ended permanently the dynasty of St. Louis University. To my knowledge, St. Louis University has never returned to a college cup championship game since then. Another story that hits close to home here, you know, I live in Washington, D.C. This guy, everyone knows this guy, Freddie Adu. And everyone thinks about Freddie Adu and they think, man, what a, what a, you know, just an amazing story. The youngest player in professional sports history at the time, he was 14 years old when he signed with D.C. United. He was declared the so- soccer's Michael Jordan because back then in the, in, in the early 2000s, people didn't really understand what soccer was like. So you had to de- equate it to something that, they thought would make sense. And so Freddie was declared to be soccer's Michael Jordan at the age of 14. They essentially said that the future of of U.S. soccer would ride on him and his back. And the pressure that he had to go through at such a young age, thrust into the spotlight, again, to a a major population that didn't know a lot about soccer. And I'm not saying D.C., I'm talking about the United States. And he was basically said to be the golden child. And that pressure followed him throughout his career. He played for 15 clubs in nine countries. And when you look at this picture, you think, man, that's so long ago. Don Garber has hair in this picture. You think about how long ago this picture was. That man in that picture, Freddie Adu, is only 34 years old and could probably still be playing today if that pressure did not follow him throughout his career. Don Garber is still the commissioner of Major League Soccer at this point. Freddie Adu could still be playing for a team if that if, if he didn't have to go through the phase of, you know, living up to the abnormal expectations that were placed upon him. And it's served as a precautionary tale to so many. If we think about the, the, the record that he has for youngest player to ever play in a soccer game has since gone away. There's been kids who played are 13 years old, 14 years old, younger than Freddie was when he signed with DC United. But the precautions are still there where they say, hey, don't put the pressures on this on those kids like they did Freddie do. And because of that, I feel that our players are developing a lot better, sometimes even out of the spotlight that he, you know, was basically thrown into. And it through Freddie's story, we kind of learn how to handle players at a young age in their development to get them to be the best players that they can be. Now. This story is probably the single most important moment in the history of Major League Soccer and one of the biggest moments, one of the pivotal moments in American soccer history. Now, for those who don't remember this picture, the scene is MLS is back. This is the tournament that Major League Soccer did back in the summer of 2020. We're in the middle of COVID. We we have just witnessed uh, George Floyd's killing and the social justice movement that came out of that. And every single black player in the league, I believe it was over 170 players before the start of MLS is back. They all by themselves walked into the field, assembled themselves by teams, all wearing the same shirt, all putting a fist in the air to show solidarity to that movement for eight minutes and 46 seconds, which coincided with the amount of time George Floyd had Derek Chauvin's knee on his neck in the middle of all of this the league resuming people wondering what's coming the next day the the covid all you know every i gestured everything outside everything that was going on at that moment they figured out that they need to make a pivotal change not just for soccer but they need to be an example for everyone else and through this i think again this led to so many changes that are much needed not just within the construct of Major League Soccer, but in other leagues. This from this became the Black Players for Change. You have the Black Women's Player Collective that came out of this. You have the United Black Players of the USL, all of these different collectives that came together to say, what changes do we need to see? And to 
more importantly, get in front of the people to make those changes happen, to get the resources to make those changes happen. Their work continues in not just in the league, but also in their communities, funding ways to be able to provide more access and opportunity for people of color in these communities, in DC and in, in Chicago and in San Francisco, all of these different places, Oakland, the amount of work that they did while also having to battle with all the things that you and I had to deal with is nothing short of exemplary. And when we look back at this, I think that this story is going to forever be one of the pivotal moments in the history of American soccer, because these guys, all of them came together at a really, really difficult moment, not just for them, but for this country. And they decided in short, there will be change and they were going to be the ones to bring it. Now, all stories may have some happy ending, but all stories also don't have to be, you know, serious. And this next story that I think is one of the great things to come out of the culture that is Black American soccer, the Henny Derby. Now, the Henny Derby was started by these two guys, Elliot Barr and Kyle Carr. Uh, it's the great Derby in the United States. When we talk about organic derbies, this is nothing is more organic than the Henny Derby. Fan driven for black culture. It started with literally that. It started with a bed of a Henny bottle uh, and has turned into an event. And not only that, they have used this Derby that has been between for Madison and the Richmond Kickers. They've used it to do so much in their soccer communities and in their communities in general. The amount of people who know what the Henny Derby is and why it exists has grown exponentially year over year. And it's in its in no small part due to the work that Kyle and Elliot have done. They continue to do the work daily. And it's people like these two that we need to rise up and lift up and celebrate. It took two, it took two guys to create a whole event, a whole cultural phenomenon that is the Henny Derby. And it doesn't take a boardroom. It doesn't take suits in, in a bunch of people who don't know the game it takes two people for that with that love and that passion and that motivation to just say hey guys we're playing you today let's bet a hitty bottle and and that became so much more than just that hitty bottle of course it also spawned one of the greatest trophies in sports the the Henny, the Henny Derby trophy which gets passed to the winner of the Henny Derby every single year but I wanted to shout these two guys out because this is what being what being a part of soccer is all about that camaraderie that community yeah for 90 minutes your teams can go at each other and you guys can chant for your team and chant against the other team what have you but in the end it's about the community that you create and these two have created a huge community that is still still one of the great ones in this country and so as we close out and, I, and i'll entertain questions at the end as we close out there's so many stories of black players, black moments that need to be told, that need to be shared. And it's not just it's not just about me. There's so many people doing this work and through podcasts, through websites, through communities. There are so many different, you know, entities and, and groups that are coming together and saying, hey, these are the stories that need to be told and we're going to tell them. And it's on us to listen to those to those voices. So. What, what here is a bunch of podcasts that all of you can follow for the culture, River City 93, Can I Kick It podcast, which also focuses centrally on Black history moments, uh, 50 Plus Dooner, Shea Butter FC, Walking 90, Diaspora United, Black Arrow, Two Cents FC, and the Dreaming of Freedom podcast. Of course, Dr. Scott is the, is the producer of Dreaming of Freedom. But these are all Black voices in our community, and it's, be, it's on us to elevate them, to share them, because they're not just doing the work now. They've been doing the work and they're going to continue to do the work to elevate some of these, you know, stories that need to be told, but also the black players that are continually kicking butt all day, every day. Not just the Weston McKinney's and the Tim Weyas. They're diving even deeper to some of these players that you may not have heard of. And it's so much, it's so important. And I and for me, my work. And what I do is driven so much by what they do. They do this every day and they are always involved in making sure that I practice my mantra, which is to learn something new every day. 
each one of these podcasts and the people behind them are what drives me and what motivates me to continually learn, not just about all history, but especially my history, because the only people who are going out to research this are ourselves. And it, it, we need more people to be involved in that. And we also need to share that work so that we never have to reinvent the wheel ever again. So as we close out, I just want to let you know that you can find my work on several different places, but mainly all of the stories that I've done throughout the different various Black History Months over the years can be found on Stars and Stripes FC. If you click on the sections, there is a Black History Month hub, and that has every single story that I've ever written for that website. Now, obviously, there are some podcasts and, and things that I have done, and you can follow those here. Uh, first of all, you can follow me at DW on Twitter, Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky, Macedon. USA Soccercast is my soccer cast, uh, is my podcast that focuses on the U.S. national teams. We also get into a lot during Black History, and I'm going to envelop a lot of what I do during February coming up into the podcast. And then, of course, Stars and Stripes FC, where you can get all your coverage, not just for Black History Month, but throughout the year of everything U.S. soccer. So with that, just a reminder, Black American soccer history is American soccer history. We need to be better as American soccer fans at elevating this history, keeping it in the forefront and making sure that it is recognized and the people that have blazed the trail that we sit in, uh, make sure that they are known and make sure that their names are never forgotten. So with that, I thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions. Well done, Donald. Thank you very much uh, for joining and sharing that with us from the Watson brothers to the Henny Darby, quite the journey. Um, and I'd like to open it up and I see a uh, hand already. Uh, I believe Gabe Logan is raising his hand uh, with a question. Again, please state your name and where you're from uh, and then your question. Thank you, Tom. Gabe Logan. I didn't have a question. I was applauding. That was an applaud. It looked like a, a hand. Uh, so as others uh, start to think about their questions, and, and please, let's let's um, have some for, for Donald. I remember sitting in at the, the Princeton Soccer Conference, I believe in 2018, and, and Dr. Jermaine Scott um, made a presentation, and he was talking about, you know, underrepresentation um, in the national teams uh, by African Americans, and you've detailed, you know, the the few people as pioneers, and I remember I probably still have it somewhere, putting down a starting eleven for. Um, that World Cup that we didn't qualify or the next World Cup. And and I could come up with an all African-American starting lineup, more or less. Um, so the question is, how does that happen? Goes from, from very few to, you know, a, a full 11, maybe plus substitutions. Your opinion on that, please. Yeah, it's about opportunity, access, exposure. I think all those three it, go hand in hand. I, I mean, just my soccer story, I grew up, as, as you mentioned, in Michigan. I grew up outside of Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I played soccer growing up. Um, you couldn't watch a lot of soccer growing up. I think every six weeks we got Champions League. So when I tell you I'm a Real Madrid fan, as you can probably see behind me, like the reason why is because there was probably six or seven teams that I could ever watch. There was no there was no Nottingham Forest, even though even though Nottingham Forest was really good back in their you know late eighties, early nineties, they weren't on TV, and so you weren't able to dream about playing for some you know some of these teams. For me, playing soccer, I can tell you that I played with three black players throughout my entire childhood, and one of them was my brother. So, like outside of my family, two other black people throughout from from age three to age fifteen, like not a lot of players. And now because of that exposure, that access that people get, it's starting to become a different, uh, it's starting to become something where people go, Hey, this is a, something that I can get behind. I'm really good. There's a lot of, you know, soccer leagues that are forming. 
and people become interested at an early age and they continue with it, they stick with it. And because of that, we're starting to see those guys start to break through. And even then we're still, I think we're still missing so many that may not have that opportunity and have that access, which is why I think some of what, uh, you know, even, you know, black players for change, but also some of the leagues are doing to increase the amount of opportunities and access for people to play soccer in some of these urban areas makes a lot of sense. Thank you. I see uh, Peter Wilt's hand and then Chuck Carlson. Why don't we go in that order? Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Donald. A very good presentation and a very important topic. Uh, my question is, is regarding off the field. I mean, the discussion has been on, on the field, uh, black players. W what is your thought on black coaches, black executives, and ultimately black owners? and what is being done and what needs to be done? That's a great question, Peter, and thank and I thank you for it. I, I think it's it's a hard one to answer for the following reasons. We have so many leagues and, and teams who are focusing in on this and have said, that, hey, we're going to make this a priority, but you don't necessarily see that reflected in the finished product. And by that, I mean, when we look at the you know, coaches in, in Major League Soccer, there's not that many that – are African-American or have been African-American throughout the years. It, I believe uh, I believe it was uh, uh, in Chicago, Peter, that the first, Dennis Hamlet was the first, uh, and Rude, Rude Hillett around the same time were the first two uh, players that had Black descent to become a coach in Major League Soccer. And we're talking 2007, 2008. So it's not as very recent where we've seen that breakthrough, but even still, we see a lot where coaches are being hired. And when we ask Hey, what what's what's the uh, breakdown here? You know, did you hire? Did you look at any candidates of color? The answer gets kind of you know weaved around to the point where they say, "Oh yeah, we had one that might have been a finalist, or we talked to one, but we ended up with this person." And so, at the end of the day, you can talk to as many people as you want, but if you don't give them the chance and the opportunity and and not hire them, then we're still in the same position we were. And the same thing goes for ownership. We a lot of the owners that we see in major league soccer are partial owners um dc united has a couple prominent ones and in, in yo Gotti, the the rapper from memphis and then mark ingram the uh, football player but they had to get to the top of their game to even be considered for something like this it's it wasn't the dentist that that i go to down the street that's investing in dc united and being prominently featured on on you know videos and things like that it's the it's the rapper that's at the top of his game it's the football player who's won a Super Bowl and wants to invest is Kevin Durant is James Harden is those people who you know their names are ubiquitous you get you you hear them everyone knows who they are um and I think the opportunities still need to be there for the dentists and the doctor and the you know, the, you know I'm an attorney the the lawyers and the people who are are, are want to be a part of something but aren't given those opportunities to invest uh, give those opportunities to, you know, again, move up through the ranks in in executives uh, positions. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's a hard one to answer, but it requires people really approaching and really placing front of thought. Hey, maybe we should open up because I, I say the famous story uh, is Mike Tomlin, the coach of the Steelers. Mike Tomlin was not supposed to be hired as coach of the Steelers, but because of the Rooney rule, which was instilled by their owner, he got an interview. And he wowed them so much, he got hired. That can happen here in soccer. It's just that a lot of those, a lot of these black coaches, a lot of these even assistant coaches, you know, referees, uh, execs, owners, they don't get that chance. Thank you. Chuck Carlson. Hi, uh, Donald. Thank you very much. Chuck Carlson from Chicago. Um, thank you for the excellent presentation. My question is a bit more historical. Um, the, um, I came across a tweet the other day from Buffalo Soccer History about Randy Smith, a Buffalo Braves basket NBA player uh, who tried out apparently for uh, Tampa Bay of the NASL. And so I'm wondering if you've come across other players. I know the great Gil Heron from Chicago was a fantastic cricket player as well. I'm wondering if you've come across athletes from other sports, from baseball and basketball in particular, that have gone into the black players that have gone into the soccer arena. Thanks. 
You know, that's a great that's a great question, Chuck. And and you mentioned Gil Heron. Gil Heron, I actually was uh, about to put him in this presentation. He's the first black player to play for Celtic. Um, but what a lot of people don't remember is that he he came back. He played for a little bit in my hometown, Detroit, and then he went to Chicago. Uh, uh, and then from there, he got married. And his son is Gil Scott Heron, who was one of the great American poet musicians ever. Um, so, yes, that, that's that's a great, great analogy. And, and also Black Arrow, I mentioned him. His nickname was the Black Arrow and Black Arrow FC. Their inspiration was Gil Heron. So that's it's great that you mentioned that. But you see that actually in some other sports. And even nowadays, you see players who say they got into soccer or they played soccer growing up, but got out of it. And Dominican Sue uh, literally said he played until they they said, you are way too big. Um, a lot of times we have guys that we, everyone says, what if LeBron James could play soccer? It ain't no six, eight guys playing soccer, right? Because they get told they're too big. Tim Duncan is another example of a guy who said he played soccer. And then they said, hey, man, you're seven foot tall. You can't do this anymore. You should play basketball. And so those things that a lot of our a lot of our athletes become too too big this way or too big this way, uh, and they get steered into another sport. So, it, but the thing is, a lot of them talk about how how their footwork that you need the the, the technical ability from soccer helps them in those other sports. Dom Sue is you know wax poetic about the fact that if he didn't play soccer, he would not be as good a football player as he was. Right, Tim Duncan, his his fun he, the big fundamental. Right, he said he learned a lot of that by you know the post-it moves he learned that by playing soccer in the virgin islands growing up and and learning how to move with your feet and also move when the ball is not in your hands because you know of course in soccer the ball's never in your hands so i think those those are a couple of examples but there's so many guys now that you see especially now that soccer is is such a big sport now in the country you're going to see more players who in other sports who may be going out for soccer and vice versa uh, we see, we see, obviously, a lot of soccer players go to play football and kick or anything like that. But uh, you're starting to see people try to do the same on the other side. You know, um, you, Usain Bolt tried out for the Central Coast Mariners back uh, a few years ago. Chad Ochocinco said he tried, he tried to play, or I think it was Sporting Kansas City. He tried out for uh, after his playing days were done with uh, with football. Uh, didn't quite make it, but also it kind of shows how how good you have to be at soccer to make it at soccer. It's, it's not the sport where anyone can just, you know, throw a, throw a good athlete in there and they're going to make it, right? Like you say, both the fastest person to ever live. He couldn't do that with a soccer ball. So it, it's it's interesting to see how that will flow. And I think that's going to continue as more people start out playing soccer growing up. Thank you very much. David DeRico has his hand up. David. You have to unmute yourself, David. Gentlemen, it's a great honor to be uh, at this session. And Donald, um, great presentation. Uh, we're doing a, a lot of projects with African, African countries, 55 African nations, and tying it into the Central South America, North America, and um, we definitely need to connect you and I. The it, It's really interesting. I'm going down the list of all of the brothers. And these guys were brothers. These were not just regular guys, right? These were the guys who were in the trenches with us. Doc Lawson, he was on five teams with me. Odie Cannon, Dale Russell, Elson Seal, Johnny Newsom, Carl Rose, Clyde Best. Uh, Ace Netzalengue, Adi Coker, Tony Whelan, Tony Wheels. I'm a man you guy for the last 50 years in Celtic because, uh, you know, I came from the Carney Scots. As Tom will tell you, we have five captains and a national team come out of one small bar. Tom Flory in the 30s, myself, Harks, Ramos, and Miola, and uh, Arsene August, all these amazing players. But the interesting thing is, those guys weren't represented well, and nor the NASL, MISL guys represented well. So that's part of my passion. And Tom, I want to talk to you about the SASH election and all that good stuff, because you guys are doing some phenomenal stuff. They, I see David Pat, uh, Kilpatrick, all these really cool people here. And uh, 
this this is timely. This is timely because not only we're talking about African American players. What about the women? What about the women of all different cultures? What about mm -hmm. the inner cities? What about making it applicable? And Peter is big into this. Inner cities taking this land that's you know destroyed and all that, and making training centers for futsal for training for uh, getting the African American. I grew up in in the projects in the ghetto in in Harrison, and you know my mother had she, she, we had eight kids, government housing, welfare, food stamps. My mother, you know, had to go back and she got her in her, her high school degree, her interior design degree, and she was my hero. How how do we get that message to the kids today? Right? Mm -hmm. Like you said it, Donald, you got to see people of your own color, of your own achievement, and say, hey, look at all this stuff happened, but what are we gonna do now? How are we gonna work together? Because as I think we all might agree, there's a lot of things that need to be cleaned up in American soccer right now. And uh, um, and the African-American, uh, the underserved community is absolutely crucial. And we're working with a group called uh, Sports Philanthropy Network. That's exactly what we're doing, working with former athletes, helping them transition into the new, you know, the new society and getting involved and helping the underserved kids. We're teaching STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and math, financial literacy, uh, NIL for good. People don't so, even know so what NIL so, is. So Donald, please, could you re respond to that? How, how do we potentially get a, um, these communities involved? And then you can morph to a question that came up on the chat uh, from, Silvis, um, saying your work, your impact, as well as the folks, you know, that you referenced that are, you know, doing this work. What do you think the impact of that will be on the next generation? So kind of a generational question from your generation yeah. to the next generation. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, first, let me let me respond to, to David's question. And it's, it's an important one. I think the first thing you think about is it's got to be a priority. Like, I, I, my dishes are in the, in right here and they need to be cleaned. No one's going to clean it. Right. I, if I make it a priority to clean these dishes, they'll get clean. Right. If we want to make it where people have this access and they have this opportunity and, and we, we fund, you know, have these clinics, you know, just bustling full of people, it's got to be a priority. And, and it's not just with resources. It's got to be with time. Uh, it's got to be recognizing the people who are doing the work and, and backing them up, elevating that work. Uh, I, I I advise for a a group called the Sports Creative, and they create places to play in safe area or safe places to play in very hostile areas all around the world, from Brazil to Philadelphia. And I've seen firsthand the work that they do. It's so inspiring because it transforms a community. It also becomes a safe place for that community to play, for the community to hang. It becomes you know a meetup point. And even in Brazil. The, the the rival gangs going back and forth with each other, they will stay away from the safe place that is the soccer field because they understand the importance to the community and they go, whatever happens, that is neutral ground, that is neutral territory. That kind of importance is so powerful. And we can have that here. We just have to make it collectively a priority to emphasize these things and, and make it where if people are looking for funding, it's not, it's not about you know, hey, D, write, write these checks. It's about investing your time, investing your, your effort into making sure that it's successful, creating it where the community can take it from you and, be, and it becomes a sustainable thing for that community, a place where, for, where kids can go to play. Because it, we all were kids. We all, there was no qualms about going out and playing after school. I'm, I'm from the era where we didn't, like, we, I had an Atari, but you weren't allowed to play it until it got dark. You were supposed to get out of the house and play something. And that that freedom that you that just like, you know, no frills freedom it is it's not something that we kind of have right now. And it's something that these kids still want and still desire that ability to just go out and play and have fun and in the process, learn something. And I think also we just got to get through the red tape. 
there's a lot of red tape involved in, in some of this stuff. That, and even, you know, back in the day, there used to be players who could just show up at some of these events. They didn't have to be asked. They didn't have to go through agents or, or teams to get their appearance. They would go, yo, this is a really cool deal, deal that you got going. It's on Saturday at 12. Count me in. I'm there. And they would just show up. And so, they still do. But a lot of times the red tape gets in the way. So even that needs those barriers need to be rebroken down uh, in an effort to make this a priority. So, uh, uh, David, thank you for your question. I did want to answer Sills' question. Sills is a good friend of mine. Uh, and the question that Ebony sent and Ebony, uh, just to restate the question, what kind of impact are you hoping your work and the work of those around you has in this generation? The question from Ebony is a very personal one because Ebony is a product of that impact. Um, you know, she and I go way back. She was she she probably wasn't even allowed to be in the bar when I first met her through American Outlaws, but she wanted that responsibility to build her community. And she's done so much in Raleigh, uh, in, in, in the Raleigh Durham area to really build soccer communities all around her, to uplift the voices of other people just like her around her. Um, I've seen, I, I literally put her to work like the second I met her and she, she still jokes about this, but like I saw in her that impact and through her, and I've, I've, I've never been disappointed in the more than a decade that I've known her. And through that, I think, I, I think the main thing, when I shout out all those podcasts that I listen to and I take inspiration from, I know all those people. There's so many that I didn't know three years ago, four years ago. There's so many people who didn't have those podcasts or didn't have that platform a couple of years ago, and they decided to create it. That initiative, that that drive is that's that's what motivates me. And I my hope for our work is that it makes it easier for people like me and for people like Sills and Ebony and others to do what we're doing. They won't have to as as Jay Z once said. Hope did that, so hopefully you won't have to go through that. I hope that all the barriers and, and the the pardon me, the BS that we have to go through to break down doors and and get some you know access to, and to write some of these stories, I'm doing that so that they don't have to. So that when they look back, they can go, man, the, this trail that was blazed by you know Ebony and Silves and 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 Sky and and you know myself and and other people that it's something that. Uh, and I see, I see Devin on here. Devin does it in other ways, right? He's not, he's not, he's, he's involved in, in the supporters world, right? He, he's a liaison. He makes it easier for supporters to be true to themselves and support their team. That is super important. So for me, I hope the impact that we leave is that it's so much easier for the people to come after us to step in and take this, this, this ball of energy and carry it forward. So that again, they make it easier for the generation in front of them. It takes a lot of work. Uh, it takes a lot of sweat. We talk about it all the time, uh, how how frustrating it can be. Um, but in the end, we know that what we're doing is setting up the future for success. And so we choose to to bite that bullet and do it because we know it's important. Thank you for that. We're going to go to someone I know you know. Uh, Dr. Marcus Cranston with a question. Hey, Donald. Be I'm homesick, so I'll, I'll stay off uh, <laughs> off camera here. <laughs> it's actually the only way I can get to the meetings, I guess, is by being homesick rather than the clinic. But uh, I, I wanted to expand on uh, some of the uh, question that uh, some of the other people have, have mentioned, and that's, you know, I've been looking at the goal scorers. And, um, hmm. you know, up until this last uh, decade or so, most of the uh, black U.S. national team players came through kind of three tracks. They were either the you know immigrant uh, family or immigrant parents. Um, they were you know had the military father, uh, but grew up in another country, or they were accidental. And uh, you know you mentioned Eddie Pope, and he had a picture of Zardes, and those guys just got a flyer at home, and uh, you know from their brothers uh, that they they weren't really that interested in soccer and just kind of accidentally got into it. But, you know, now we have these guys, you know, our generation coming up through the MLS academies and and, and all. And, and I'm just curious how, uh, you know, with, especially with your, you know, connection with DC United and, and all, how much is the MLS doing to to, to, to reach out specifically to the black communities, and, um, you know, to, to, to reach these 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 kids? You know, Marcus, this is a great question. Um, 
and, and first off, shout out to you. We'll uh we'll probably be seeing each other very soon. Um, but I, I think it with MLS and even USL and even NISA, you go all the way down to UPSL, some of these teams just do it better than others. And there's no real explanation for it. It's I think the first thing that I would do, especially when DC United, when we if I were to if they were to ask me about it, I'd say you need to know your community first. You need to know who's in your community, you need to know where they're playing soccer and go where they're where they're playing. Right. Don't have the, the tryouts that hey, come come see us if you're really interested. No, you need to be going into these communities making inroads. And from there you may find the next, you know, Josie Altador. You may find the next Clint Dempsey by just going into some neighborhoods and going, oh, that kid plays really well. Why don't you, you know, I'm glad I came. Why don't you, you know, you can strike a conversation with them. And then they understand that, hey, you're you're willing to come into my neighborhood, which may or may not be the best neighborhood in the city. You're willing to come in here and say, hey, we want you instead of you saying, why don't you come over here? And if, if you're serious about it, you come here because some people don't have those means. Uh, and I think, again, you look at you look at Atlanta, right? Like, maybe not necessarily with the actual team, but definitely with the supporters, they figure out a way to tap into those communities and say, Hey, we want you to forsake the, the, the traditional games that we play here in Atlanta, football, basketball, baseball. And we want you to come to a soccer game because we think you're going to enjoy it. And sh- sure enough, they, they've built that up to where you know, again, 40,000 people show up every week. And a lot of that is based on the, communities that they have gone and represented you know and we see that across the country uh, and i mentioned other you know some cities do it better than others some cities have a lot of work to do to either build or rebuild those those uh bridges to some of these communities to invite people back uh, and it's not just it's not just african americans right like it, dc united we have a huge we used to have a huge bolivian population to show up at games we used to have a huge salvadorian population to show up at games and we still kind of do but even those need to continually be managed and continually be cultivated so that, again, the next generation knows, hey, my my dad went to the D.C. United game. My mom went to the D.C. United game. My aunt went to the D.C. United game. I'm going to the D.C. United game. And there's no – you don't have to worry about capturing those people because you're already in those communities and doing the work to bring them in. So it's it, – it's one of those things where I, I think, you know, DC United at some, some points I'm like, Hey, they're doing a good job. And some points I, I'm very frustrated. So they're kind of the, the 50, 50. Um, but I know there's some communities in, in, in some, some areas of the country where we can be doing a lot better to bring in some of these people, not just to play, but even to experience the game so that it becomes something that they become interested in. I didn't know there was a world of soccer until I went to my first game. That's all it took. But I needed that chance. And thankfully, two of my friends gave me that chance. And because of that, I'm standing here talking to you today. So it, it's it's definitely something where that opportunity, that access, the more we increase it, the more we bring people in for the first time, they, they will get hooked and they'll come back. And then they're going to be the leaders that we interview years from now. We're uh, coming up on an hour, which is perfect timing. Um, any other questions, comments uh, Donald, out there? Um, again, excellent stuff. The other guys, and you talked about Tomlin at the Steelers. Mm-hmm. You, the way it is, it is, the reality is you have to build in mechanisms to give people a free, an uh, equal opportunity. And no, nobody's talking about Tony Sana, one of my favorite players, Eddie Pope, Tony uh, what about what about Demarcus, man? He, I love this guy. He's unbelievable. But the thing with Tony, Tony's the head of DEI, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, for the MLS. So he is a part of the group that's le- picking the actual people, working with eat from from the guy sweeping the floor all the way up to the owners on what that means and how to. You know, not just soccer, but how to do it on a broad scale. And and the other question I have, I, are you familiar with Robert Woodard, um, why black people don't play soccer in America? Mm-hmm. He, I mean, he's a great guy. He's got this amazing book. With, bottom line, and it, this seems to go out throughout the whole theme, we have to work together as a group, right? And you have to make specific things like this 
a, a specific priority and then put the steps in place. Because all the people here, the wealth of information they have, if we work together, um, it'll make the World Cup, you know, my goal is that we win the World Cup in 2026 and we win it with an American style of soccer. Well, that takes everybody, right? The best of the best. And 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 guys like Tony, you know, he's just doing an amazing, amazing job. Class guy, got himself in this position. Now they've hired him to hire all these DEI people to teach in those in those clubs. Well, shouldn't that be through all the other sports as well? Soccer to me should be the leader in all the innovative, creative stuff, uh, but we have to work together. What What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, and you mentioned Tony Sana. He you you mentioned all the work that he's doing uh, from a DEI perspective with Major League Soccer, but he's done it on his own in Minnesota. Uh, you know, American Outlaws was the first supporters group to sign on to uh, Common Goals, the Anti Racist Project, and a lot of what that foundation was was based in part on his anti racist training principles. Uh, we've done, we've conducted trainings of our staff. We've conducted trainings of our board and chapter leaders so that when things occur in the stands or at events, they know how to borrow from, from my, you know, current college coach, uh, Kara Lawson to handle the hard better, right? We can't always make it easier to be in the stands, but we can make it more welcoming. We can make it more inclusive. And a lot of what Tony Sana has done, not just in Minnesota, but across the country is inspiration for us. And we use those tools. We had a nice conversation uh, back in Minnesota in September uh, where he he expressed his frustrations at how things were working and, and provided feedback to us and how we can be a part of that change that he seeks and that we all seek. So uh, it's a great shout and it's something that we all can continue to do again, making it a priority to keep building on what we have done and learning from our past mistakes to, in an effort to not uh, replicate them. Those are the keys to, to making this a better to make, you know, when I look in the stands or when you see players on the field or, or what have you, that it represents the country that we all live in a diverse country full of people of great people who are doing wonderful things and if provide the same access ain't nobody stopped the united states of america thank you and why don't we end on that uh very positive note it uh reminds me of former u.s soccer secretary hank steinbrecher's e pluribus unum uh speech that he gave from many one and uh, may that one uh, lead us uh, not only to Women's World Cup glory, but uh, uh, other World Cups on other levels uh, within U.S. soccer. So uh, a hearty thank you from the Society to Donald Wine the second for joining us. Uh, thank you for your history. Thank you for your advocacy. Uh, and the happiest of holidays to uh, all our members and everyone else on this call. Thank you for joining us. Thank Great. you. Thank, Thank you, you so guys. much. Appreciate you.